All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation. My name is Ashley Rumpschlag. I'm the CEO and president of Teresa's Fund and DomesticShelters.org. Um, I'm joined today uh, by Rachel Myers, our digital services specialist, and Hannah Craig, our senior content strategist and creator. Rachel and Hannah will be monitoring the chat in the Q&A box today throughout the presentation. All right. Uh, we are so excited today to be hearing from Katie Campbell with Red Rover uh, about creating pet friendly domestic violence shelters. Uh, just a reminder, today's presentation will be 60 minutes and we'll save some time at the end for question and answer. Uh, just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, as you see here, we do have live closed captionings available uh, for today's webinar. To enable, uh, just click the more button in the menu and show subtitles. A transcript will also be provided within a week of the presentation. Just some Zoom reminders, everyone here, your, your um, cameras are turned off along with your microphones, so you're in listen-only mode. Um, if you have questions, let's go right in the Q&A box. You'll see that uh, button for Q&A in the menu bar. And if you would like to chat with anyone uh, in the presentation, share your reactions, thoughts, things of that nature, go ahead and throw those in the chat box. And as a reminder, we do send out our certificate for this webinar, um, a transcript and the webinar recording uh, and any additional resources mentioned throughout the presentation will be shared in an email to, to you uh, within a week of the presentation. Um, if anyone here is calling in, so you're listening only on your phone, you dialed in today, please send an email to info at domesticshelters.org uh, and just with your email address. So send us an email and we'll have that email address and add you to our, our list for, for sending out content. If you're logged in on Zoom on your computer right now, no need to send an email. Oh, I'm so sorry. We'll click back here again. Try this again. All right. Okay. Oh. Oh, happy clicking today. So save the date. May or May 12th, Thursday, May 12th, uh, we are welcoming Lundy Bancroft here. If you attended our last webinar, we did a quick poll on what you guys want us to hear about. So session one, we're gonna talk about why does he do that, the profile and tactics of men who abuse. And session two, we're gonna talk about healing and recovery in children exposed to domestic violence. Uh, so save the date for that. We're gonna have registration here uh, in the next week or so. Uh, another one as well, save the date for our the next one in the series with eBodyGuard on Thursday, May 19th. And we're gonna focus on law enforcement in that one. And just a reminder, there's still time to submit those Purple Ribbon Awards uh, nominations. So go to purpleribbonawards.org um, and make sure that you submit those nominations before the end of the day tomorrow. And then there's that email address again, info at domesticshelters.org. My goodness. Having troubles with my navigations today. Okay, well, we are just so well, so excited to have Katie Campbell back. Uh, she joined us. It's been remember those years before the pandemic when uh, we no no actually it was it was in the middle of the pandemic. It was in 2020 uh, in June. Uh, Katie joined us and uh, she did a fantastic presentation about pet shelters. And this time we're just going to go and kind of cover a little bit more. Um, recap of what she covered, but then go in a little bit more depth of the barriers um, to, to starting a pet shelter. So Katie, thank you so much for being here today. We're so, so excited to have you and really looking forward to hearing uh, what you have to share today. Uh, Ashley um, and Rachel and Hannah, um, just super excited to be, to be back here again. And in 2020 feels, I don't know, like a decade ago, I think. I think it was at least. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have very little recollection of what, what things were like all the way back then. So um, very excited to have you back. Yeah. Thank you. And, and you're absolutely right. We'll do, um, you know, kind of a, a really short um, recap of, of, you know, kind of just this whole idea of becoming pet friendly. But I really wanted to just take a deeper dive into talking through some of the barriers, some of the challenges that folks might be facing uh, when thinking about becoming pet friendly. So uh, why don't we uh, get this started? I will share my screen, hopefully. Let's see. 
two seconds and we'll have it all set up. Yeah, awesome. Great on my end. Cool. Thank you. Um, really great to see the chat uh, and where everybody is is joining us from. Um, super nice to see uh, some some names and some some organizations that I know. Um, so just super excited to uh, to have you all here. Um, we will definitely kind of breeze through some of these um, slides just because I want to make sure that we leave enough time um, for questions and answers um, at the end. Uh, and you're going to get these slides, so don't worry. Um, I know the domesticshelters.org team is, is going to share these out with folks, so you're going to have um, all this information. Um, so you know, don't worry. You don't have to take you know, mad notes and you don't have to take uh, a lot of screenshots, um, you will definitely have this information um, as we uh, as we end. OK, so uh, this is what we'll cover. We'll talk a little bit really brief about Red Rover. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about who I am. Um, we'll talk uh, really briefly about the why. Um, and, you know, all of you are already here. And so, you know, you probably already know the importance of creating pet housing programs to support uh, people and pets in crisis and, and domestic violence survivors. Uh, so we'll kind of breeze through that really quickly. Um, we'll spend most of our time in this challenges section um, and really talking about some strategies to overcome um, the challenges that we hear about most often. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about how uh, pet housing programs are really or can really be a benefit uh, for you. And then we'll talk about some resources and next steps. Um, now, I would love to get y'all's help with, with some stuff. Um, so if you've ever used Mentimeter before, um, it's a really cool, uh, a cool thing that we are starting to use um, pretty often around here. Uh, and it's a way for us to kind of gain some data. Um, and, you know, as you all know, uh, data is super, super important for all of us. So I would love to have you go to www.menti.com and use that code 56325146. And share if you are currently accepting companion animals. Now, companion animals uh, are pets. Um, these are not service animals, and these are not emotional support animals. Okay, so these are just folks pets, folks companion animals. Um, and so hopefully you all are seeing the votes as they're coming in. Um, Ashley, is that what you're seeing just to make sure I shared properly? I am seeing it. My mind is absolutely blown right now. This is so cool. I'm so glad you're bringing this tool to our attention. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, seriously, um, if you all are not using Mentimeter and you're doing like these kind of presentations uh, kind of things and you want to gain data, but you also just kind of want like a cool thing to show, um, Mentimeter is super cool. Um, would definitely encourage you to check it out. They do have a free version. Um, you don't get all the bells and whistles. Um, but it's, it's a really cool thing to, to kind of engage the audience and get some data. So uh, it looks like we've got a few folks who do accept companion animals. Um, we've got some who don't, and then we've got some who would like to, but need some help. So I, I think folks are in the right places. Uh, I think this should be, this should be an interesting time. So I'm going to click off of that screen, but you can still absolutely hop in there and, um, and add your votes to that. Um, and what I can do after the fact, um, after we're done um, today, and when that email goes out to all of you, um, I can actually share some of this data with you as well. So excellent. So keep those votes coming in. Um, we are going to move forward um, with another question. So I would love to know, what do you hope to get out of this presentation? Um, you know, I think you can add up to three things. So feel free to add away. And then I'm gonna advance over here in Menti. So it should automatically advance for you here in a second. And this one's gonna look a little bit different. Same code, same website. You should be able to, to see now a different screen on menti.com that says, what do you hope to get out of this presentation? You should have the opportunity to say, I think up to three things and it'll even allow you to add more than three. Love it. Awesome. Keep them coming, keep them coming. Oh, this is great.
this is really setting the stage, I think, for today. We got, uh, I think we'll, we'll get you a lot of what you're looking for today. It looks like just a, knowledge, a lot of resources, a lot of knowledge, um, support, some program design, um, overcoming barriers. I love, uh, I, I think I saw inspiration in there. So hopefully you will, you will leave inspired. Um, ultimately want you to, to leave feeling a little more confident about starting a pet housing program or just your next steps. Um, or if you have a program, um, you know, maybe we can give you some insights uh, on tweaks that you might want to make. So that's great. You can keep those answers coming as well. And I'm going to go back to our slides. So this is really awesome. We'll use this, I think, about two more times. So um, definitely leave that website up for yourself. So um, my name is Katie Campbell. I'm the Director of Collaboration and Outreach. Um, I've been with Red Rover for a little over six years now. Um, and before that, I came from the human services world. And so I very much understand, um, you know, what it means to be providing services uh, to people in crisis. Um, and so, you know, when I talk about and I work with you all on creating pet housing programs, you know, I, I know that I'm asking you to, to maybe do some extra work. Um, but I, I'm doing it knowing um, fully well what it is that I'm asking you to do. Um, so, you know, please just kind of stick with me and, and um, you know, open up your mind to the possibilities because I think there is really something powerful when we think about pet housing programs, uh, when we switch our thinking from the barriers and challenges of it to really the tools that a pet housing program can bring to you. Um, you know, I often think about pets as a free tool at your disposal. So, you know, we know science tells us that dogs especially uh, help lower our stress level. They help lower our blood pressure, right? Pets also create this really great opportunity for you to build trust with the folks that you're trying to work with. Um, they're also this really great opportunity to help build your staff morale. So when you're able to say to a survivor, you know, on that intake line, oh, you have a pet, yes, we can take you and all of your family um, and your, your staff don't have to say no. Like that's a really powerful piece. Um, and also just, you know, think about um, how pets can maybe help your survivors and those people in crisis move to whatever their success is, however they determine their success. Pets can really help folks move um, to that success more quickly. Um, and so I, you know, really let's, let's just think about, uh, you know, pets as a benefit um, rather than a barrier for just a little bit, okay? So Red Rover, uh, we're about 35 years old now. Um, we started with this program here in the middle, Red Rover Responders. Uh, it's kind of like the Red Cross for animals. So we train volunteers all throughout the US and Canada. I know we have a, a few Canadian folks joining us, um, but we train volunteers on how to provide temporary emergency, emergency sheltering services in natural disasters, cruelty situations, um, seizures, that kind of thing. We've also started sending our volunteers out with our good friends at the Rescue Rebuild Program um, to actually help make pet-friendly spaces at domestic violence shelters. It's a very cool program. Um, over on the right, you see our Red Rover Readers Program. It's all about teaching um, kids about kindness, compassion, and empathy for pets and people, for animals and people uh, through books. Uh, and then over on the left is our Red Rover Relief Program. Um, so this is where all of our domestic violence work lives, our safe escape grants, our safe housing grants, safeplaceforpets.org. Uh, and we also have some emergency vet care grants listed under that as well. Those are called our urgent care grants. So in a nutshell, um, that is Red Rover. We started in 2007 with our Safe Escape grants. In 2012, we started with our safe housing grants. I'll tell you more about those um, towards the end of our time together. Um, but, you know, we pretty quickly realized when we started those safe housing grants that it wasn't just enough to provide the grant money um, to help folks create the pet friendly programs. We need, really needed to walk that walk with you all um, and help provide support uh, when and where you needed it. And so that's really where um, this work that I'm going to talk to you about came from. Um, so in 2019 and really in 2020, uh, 
Red Rover partnered up with Rescue Rebuild um, program. They're from Greater Good Charities. They're basically a nonprofit construction program. So we teamed up to offer something called the Don't Forget the Pets um, collaborative project. And that project really is designed to help you walk through the entire process of creating a program from understanding the importance of it or the why through how to collaborate, who to collaborate with, um, to actual construction, renovation, program design, to policies and procedures in your program structure, to fundraising. And so what we're going to do today is kind of take a small snippet of that uh, and walk through a few of the challenges that we most often hear about. Okay. Uh, so this is the section that I'm going to kind of breeze through um, pretty quickly. Um, you know, just so you know, uh, I'm sure many of you probably have pets at home. Um, we're not alone. About 70% of American homes have pets. Um, that is from a survey 2021 20, uh, to 2022. It's up about 5%. Um, from the year before COVID, so 2019. Um, and we also see that there are a lot of American homes with kids as well, right? So pets really are a part of the family. Um, this may not be anything new to you all, this idea of the link, but essentially research tells us that when one of these types of violence is happening in a home, there is the likelihood that one of the other types of violence is happening in the home. And so for us in particular, we're really, um, you know, concerned about domestic violence and animal abuse. Um, Phil Arco, who is the National Link Coalition Coordinator, I think said it more beautifully than research could ever say it when he said, when animals are abused, people are at risk. When people are abused, animals are at risk. Okay. Um, this is some of the foundational research. Uh, many of you have probably seen this cited in many places. And so, um, you know, this really from the late 90s, early 2000s just kind of showed us that about 71% of people experiencing domestic violence were also um, experiencing animal abuse, okay? What I really wanna highlight today is that there's some new research happening. So I really encourage you to check out um, somebody uh, by the name of Andrew Campbell. He is of no relation to me, uh, but really great guy. He's doing some really cool research in Indiana and he's kind of taking, um, he's overlaying uh, animal abuse incidents with intimate partner violence or domestic violence incidents, and he's seeing where it's overlapping um, from a geospatial sense. Um, he's also reviewing um, the uh, reports, the law enforcement uh, reports, uh, when officers are responding to domestic violence cases. Uh, and really what we're seeing is that when animal abuse is occurring with intimate partner violence or domestic violence, um, these are even uh, more dangerous situations, okay? Um, there's a really great qualitative study by Michelle Newberry that kind of takes all of the research, that foundational stuff, even some of the newer stuff and puts it into one, uh, one paper for you. Um, it's a really great one. Um, I'm sorry, that was actually uh, Michelle Cleary's the one at the bottom. Um, really great one. Um, and then uh, Michelle Newberry's uh, also has a really great study, a little more recent, 2017, that kind of talks about some of the things um, that were called out in that foundational research and just kind of brings it um, into the here and now. So definitely some great research for you to keep an eye on. Um, the Urban Resource Institute in New York City also recently paired up with the National Domestic Violence Hotline. They surveyed, I think it was about 2,300 um, folks, survivors who were um, calling in, texting in, asking for resources um, about their experience of domestic violence and animal abuse. And this is what they had to say. 30% um, said that their children had witnessed or been aware of the pet abuse. 76% um, had actually noticed changes in their pet's behavior. Um, and 97% of them said that keeping their pet with them factored in into their decision to seek shelter. 91% uh, say that their pets play a significant role in their ability to survive and heal. And 72% were unaware that any DV shelters accepted pets, uh, that there was even such a thing as a pet housing program. And so I really like using um, this research uh, because it shows obviously that there is a link between human and animal violence, that kids are seeing it, uh, but also that 
pets play an important role and that we really need to do a good job of letting domestic violence survivors know um, that there are resources when we have them um, to offer. Generally speaking, about 50% of domestic violence survivors will delay leaving um, out of concern for their pets. We've certainly heard from some survivors who have lived in their car for months um, rather than leaving them behind and they weren't able to find a safe place to go with their pets. Um, a ASPCA had a study back in I think it was 2015 that said that about 25% of survivors actually returned to their abuser out of concern for their pet. So they initially weren't able to leave with their pet and then the abuser used that um, as a tactic, a tactic to get the survivor to return home. And we also know that about um, 22 to 57% of women experiencing homelessness uh, are doing so because of domestic violence. And so we know that there is a big crossover between um, folks experiencing homelessness and folks experiencing domestic violence. I'm going to breeze through this. You'll see it later. Um, you know, the data is really important and, and we need the numbers and we, you know, we need that research and those studies. Um, but it's also really important to get the other side of that. And that's the perspective of, you know, you all who are helping um, survivors, but also um, survivors themselves. So I will let you all read those later. Um, because what I really want to do is talk about solutions, right? And so um, why create a pet housing program? Well, as we saw, if we're able to give survivors a resource to take their pets, um, we're able to eliminate a barrier to safety, right? Um, we're gonna keep survivors and pets safe. Uh, we're gonna eliminate that reason or one of those ways that a abuser um, can force or coerce the survivor to return home. We're gonna reinforce the human animal bond. You know, we saw that 91% of survivors said that their pet played a significant role in their ability to heal and survive. And so we're going to support that, right, um, in that healing process. And it's also just a really, really great way uh, for you to help build trust with your survivors when you're able to help their entire um, family. So when we talk about a pet housing program, uh, what do we mean? Generally speaking, we break pet housing programs up into two different categories. One is on-site housing uh, or co-sheltering. And basically that just means the survivor is at your emergency shelter with their pet. Um, we also have this other pretty broad category called off-site housing. Generally speaking, this might mean uh, that the pet is being housed at an animal organization, a rescue, uh, might be at a boarding facility or even in a foster-based situation. For the purposes of today, we're really going to focus on this on-site housing piece. So how do we have people um, and their pets together in the same um, in the same facility, the same location? Uh, so it sounds really easy, right? We all want to do it. Uh, this is your chance to really kind of dive deep into the barriers um, and, and let me know what are your challenges uh, or barriers to creating a pet housing program. Uh, why, why is it hard to do that? So I'm gonna ask you to go to menti.com again, put in that code and we'll see what you got. <laughs> Poop. <laughs> I love it. Um, I did not plan to talk specifically about poop uh, in one of our challenges today, um, but uh, absolutely, um, that is one that we, we do sometimes hear about. Um, folks are worried about the poop. Um, I have three dogs at home and four cats, um, and so I generally um, understand the concern of poop. Absolutely. I love it. Um, this is great, like vaccinations, liability, space. Um, animal neglect, definitely, uh, staff being afraid, totally, we're going to talk about that, not enough place or space, cleanliness, okay, these are great, money, funding, I've seen that come through a couple of times, um, land for remodels, okay, so I think that one will kind of fall under space a little bit, safety concerns, these are really great. 
board member concerns. Absolutely. Um, you know, we know that, um, you know, sometimes our board can, can feel a little, a little concerned about it or our staff um, can feel a little concerned about it. So I'll just give this another, another few seconds. Um, I did see allergies come up in the chat. I'm not sure if it came up in our mentee over here, but we're definitely gonna talk about allergies. So this is great. All right, so you all feel free to keep going um, with this. I would love to know all of your barriers. So again, this is um, really something that I can use later and, and Brent and I can use later, um, you know, with the uh, Don't Forget the Pets project and, and kind of how we're helping folks. Um, so this is great. I, I think we're going to hit on uh, a lot of what you all are identifying here. Um, if we have time, we might be able to to touch on a couple of the others, um, like supplies. Um, definitely, uh, you aren't going to have to worry about supplies. Um, this is great. Okay, so these are what you see up on the screen right now. You should be able to see uh, my slides again. Um, these are the the challenges that we're really going to focus on today. Okay, and I think. A lot of what you're saying is, is going to be covered here. I love um, allergies now has come up like four times in a row. Um, so without further ado, um, let's really get into to the challenges and some of the tips for success. Um, so these are some of my tips for success. Uh, really collaboration is key. Um, you know, you don't need to be the expert in all of this. Uh, we really encourage you to tap into um, the knowledge and the support of other organizations in your community. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, we'll, we'll talk about a thoughtful pet plan. I'll tell you what that means. Um, I think one of the, the, the things I really like to tell folks um, is keep it simple. So I mentioned Urban Resource Institute earlier. Um, they're a phenomenal program, really great program here in New York City, uh, but they're also really big. Uh, you, you don't have to, to start out really big. Um, you can start out more simple. Maybe that means you just start with housing cats and then you work with your collaborative partner partners to house dogs or other animals. Um, just know that it's okay to keep it simple, to try it out, see how it works, make adjustments as you need and grow from there. Also remember, it's okay to say no. Um, you know, I come from human services. I know that it doesn't always feel great to say no, um, but just know that it's okay to say no because we're gonna talk to you about backup plans, right? Um, flexible structure, this comes from one of our great partners up in Maine um, from an uh, organization called Safe Voices. Uh, you know, they have a structure in place. They have a really good, solid um, program structure in place, but their they're, they're real, like, um, words of wisdom is to be flexible with it um, because, you know, just when you plan, you think you plan for every single instance and everything that can happen, most likely there's going to be something that comes up that you didn't plan for. And so being able to be flexible when needed, uh, really important to evaluate your program and evaluate it from the perspective of your staff, from the pet parents, um, you know, from your collaborative partners. Um, I really encourage you to evaluate so that you can see where you need to make tweaks, uh, so you can see what those successes are and then be able to share that out um, with your supporters and donors. Um, trust your skills. Gosh, folks, um, you all do amazing, amazing work each and every day. Uh, and I guarantee you have the skills that you need to do this work. Uh, you maybe just need uh, to shift your lens a little bit and shift how you, how you think about it a little bit. Um, I am most certainly not equating um, kids to pets, but honestly, if you can handle the, the dynamic of kids being in your space and families being in your space, and you know, just really managing you know, different families being together in a communal space, I promise you can handle um, all of this. Um, Cross-training is just super important um, and educate everyone. We'll, we'll dive a little bit deeper um, within these challenges on, on those, so I will save that. So challenge number one, allergies. Oh, I speak about this challenge um, from a place of understanding. Um, I am absolutely allergic to my dogs and cats. Um, and so, you know, I, I understand that allergies are a concern. 
Um, here's the thing. You can handle this in, in many different ways. There are some pretty easy things that you can do. Uh, and, you know, I think the first thing is you need to figure out which pet plan works for you. So pet plans for us in the Don't Forget the Pets project really means, are you going to house pets in individual living units? Are you maybe going to transform an existing space? Or are you going to use a new space? You're going to create a new space uh, where pets would live. Um, we're not going to go really deep into what each individual pet plan looks like just because we don't have time. I definitely invite you to join us for Don't Forget the Pets workshop so we can talk you through all of that. Um, but, you know, really thinking about which pet plan is going to work for your organization, for your facility, um, can really help guide this allergy piece, okay? Um, you know, we hear from some folks when they do in-room housing, individual living units, they're like, well, we want to make two of our six rooms pet rooms. Um, what I would encourage you to think of, if you want to do that strategy, uh, think about maybe identifying two rooms as non-pet rooms. Um, honestly, if you have folks who are really, really, really allergic to pets, um, you're not going to have that many of them. And so being able to set aside two non-pet rooms, I think, might be a better strategy um, than only setting aside two pet rooms, okay? Um, most organizations really have more success with that non-pet room idea. Uh, remove carpeting. You know, if you've got carpeting in your spaces, get that out. Um, you can uh, use a really cool product called Luxury Vinyl Tile. It's a vinyl tile. It's waterproof, um, really easy to clean. Uh, and, you know, not for nothing, it's going to be easier for you to clean just with families uh, without pets, you know, moving in and out of your facility. Um, you can think about having a separate washer and dryer, and that washer and dryer is going to be for, um, you know, the pet bedding, blankets, whatever, but also for your pet parents clothing and all of that. So all of all of the things that need to be washed with those pet families goes into that separate washer and dryer. You can get a HEPA filter on Amazon for like 150 bucks. They're not expensive. Um, you can use that in your spaces. Um, I really cleaning, a good cleaning is going to, to really be the key for you. And right now with COVID, uh, if you're cleaning for COVID, you're cleaning for allergies. Um, you know, I know that they really are a concern for a lot of folks, but there are some really pretty easy strategies that you can um, utilize for this allergy piece. So challenge number one, allergies. Challenge number two, uh, animal bites and fear. So I kind of combine these two um, because really uh, what you do for one is kind of going to um, help you out with the other. So again, we're going to the, determine the best pet plan. Um, where do we want animals to live on our property? Um, traffic flow. So this really is thinking about uh, if you have those pet rooms, those pet friendly rooms, um, where are they going to be in relation to the rest of your facility? So if you can get these pet rooms close to another exit, that's maybe you can have one exit or one door in and out that's used for pets. And then you have one door in and out that is not for pets, right? Um, you don't want to have your uh, pet spaces, like your pet friendly rooms, um, across from a kitchen um, because you're going to have folks constantly going in and out of the kitchen, right? And so what does that mean? That means dogs are going to bark because they want to say hi. And so if you have folks who are a little fearful of animals, they're probably not going to want to hear the dog barking all the time. And it's also probably going to cause a little bit of stress for the pet as well. Um, that's something we can definitely talk you through that traffic flow piece. Um, but just, you know, really kind of thinking through what makes the most sense in moving our pets in and out, um, keeping them kind of away from those high traffic areas. Uh, separate pet living room. So I know a lot of uh, shelters um, have communal spaces or a living room space for humans to kind of hang out, right? Um, you definitely want to have a separate pet living area, um, you know, uh, depending on your flow, you maybe don't have to have a, a separate um, pet living room, but you definitely just don't want pets hanging out in that living room space with your humans if you have folks who are fearful of animals, right? Um, this is a pretty easy one. Whenever pets 
whether they're cats, their dogs, their iguanas, uh, whatever, when they are outside of that designated uh, in room, that individual living unit or outside of, of that um, separate pet space, they need to be on a leash. Um, that's going to make folks feel much safer. It's going to help with your insurance and your liability concerns. Um, and it's also just going to keep animals um, from interacting with other people. Um, definitely get some training for pets and pet parents. So uh, you're going to reach out to, you're going to set up that collaborative relationship with your animal welfare partner. And you're going to get some training um, to for your, your for your pet parents um, when they need it. Some are going to need it, but when they need it, have them come in. Um, think like AKC Good Citizen Program. That's a good example. Um, you know, just having somebody come in, um, give that basic basic um, animal behavior training um, is really great for while pet and pet parent are on site. But it's also a really great piece that you can add to your pet resume, and then that pet resume is going to help your pet parents um, get into some long-term housing. Um, and again, we talk a lot more about that in the Don't Forget the Pets project, um, but just know that that's a great piece um, for your pet parents. Education for everybody. Um, you know, there are some really great posters that we can share with you about body language, about dog body language, about cat body language. So, you know, a lot of times folks want to, um, they want to educate pet parents about what it means to have pets on site. But I also really encourage you to educate non-pet parents about what it means to have pets on site. So as much as you're encouraging pet parents to keep pets away from um, other people, also encourage other people to give maybe some extra space to pet parents when they're walking in and out or walking through that space. Um, you know, educate folks on how do you actually properly introduce yourself to a dog? Uh, I don't, I mean, raise your hand if you've ever seen a child or even an adult, um, you know, walk up to a dog inappropriately. I see it all the time. Um, honestly, dogs, uh, I say dogs because that's that tends to be the biggest concern. 99.9% .9 of the time, dogs do not bite out of aggression. They just don't. What happens is we as humans have missed about 100 signs that the dog is uncomfortable, that we're making it uncomfortable, and we cause that bite. And so I really encourage you to educate everyone about what it means to have pets on site. Um, and when I mean educate, also uh, telling them and sharing um, sharing the value of, of having pets on site and what it means. Um, I love that comment that just came in about dogs fighting. Um, so when you work with your collaborative partner, I don't want to freak your staff out, but do give them some basic training on how to break up a dog fight. There are some really good, um, easy things that you can have on site, like a blow horn, um, a bite stick. Um, you know, if you have really good protocols in there, um, you know, you're going to lessen the opportunity for dog fighting, but you definitely want to set your staff up um, for success uh, if they should ever have to, right? Um, and then the last bullet point I have on here, opportunity to create a new story. So yes, folks might come in and they might be fearful of pets. There might be a, and, and there is a really valid reason as to why they are fearful of pets. Um, but this could be an opportunity to give them a new story. Um, if they uh, had experienced abuse and they uh, and animal abuse was a part of that abuse, and maybe their abuser was using the animal to abuse them, uh, this could be a good opportunity for a new story. Um, but also with our kids, you know, this is a great opportunity to teach them an appropriate way to interact with um, to interact with pets. And so I just want to call that out um, that this could be a really good opportunity. Um, challenge number three, which I don't know if it came up uh, in, our, in our little menti poll, um, will be overrun. Uh, and so this could be lions and tigers and bears. Uh, I often get asked, well, what, what animals do we have to accept? Um, you know, are we going to, is every single survivor going to come in and, and have a pet? And so the, the answer to both of these questions um, is you set what feels good to you and your organization and what works and doesn't. Um, absolutely, uh, this idea of the link between human and animal violence 
we are not just talking about common companion animals. We're not just talking about dogs and cats and fish and birds. We are absolutely talking about horses and cows and mini horses and goats and chickens, um, all of the above. Uh, we have certainly had uh, domestic violence shelters that have faced those kind of issues. When we talk about some of those more um, you know, less than common um, companion animals, most of the time folks, what they're doing is they're working with their collaborative animal organization to get those pets out to a, a boarding situation or a fostering situation. So um, I encourage you to think about, don't forget about those, uh, those non-traditional companion animals when you're planning your program structure and you're working with your collaborative partners. Generally speaking, we see that about 10% of your bed population is going to have a pet. So if you have 10 beds, I'm gonna make math really easy for me, um, you might have one survivor um, who has a pet. Now keep in mind, they could have multiple pets. I just saw something um, in the chat about multiple pets. Um, so just keep that in mind. That 10% is, it could be higher, it could be lower. We've definitely seen it all over the board. Um, remember, it's okay to say no. So if you feel like you are at capacity, whatever your capacity is, it's okay to say, no, we can't take that pet on site right now, but we have our backup plan. So we're gonna get you connected to our animal shelter. We're gonna get you connected to our foster, to our boarding facility, whatever that might look like. Um, and th this is where that flexible structure comes into play. So a lot of times um, folks will ask, well, how many pets should I cap it at? Um, I encourage you to think about it a little bit differently. So our good friends at Safe Voices, they don't have a hard cap. What they do is they just take it day by day. Um, and so, you know, they've had as many as 12 pets on site because one family had like two cats, another family had three hamsters, another family had a dog and down the line. Um, and so they really just kind of take it like, how many animals, what kind of animals are we talking about? And so they don't have a hard cap. Um, and really it's just, they, they just do what they can. They utilize their backup plan when they need to. Um, and I love that if the space is available, we have a full kennel on site. That's really awesome, Jan. Um, you know, you, I think as much as it is really important to create, you know, that, that program structure and to have those boundaries, but just know that you may need to be flexible at times. Okay. Uh, challenge number four, space limitations. I know that space came up a lot uh, on our little mentee poll. Here's the thing. You don't need a ton of space. Um, you really don't. So whether your uh, concern is space um, inside, I don't have space to actually put pets, or I don't have space for uh, dogs to go outside and exercise. For either incident, um, or for either instance, you don't need a whole lot of space. So again, you're going to determine the best pet plan, the best um, housing plan for you. Um, work with those small yards. So if you look at this middle picture right here, um, this is what we call a chuck it yard. It is not a large yard. I could maybe stand in the middle and touch both sides. It is enough space for me to throw a tennis ball back and forth. I promise you the dog doesn't care if it has a lot of space. It is just super excited to have enough space to go chase that ball. Um, so you don't need a lot of space. Um, treadmill training. We have a video up on the Don't Forget the Pets um, Project website about treadmill training. Um, this comes in really handy if you have no outdoor space. If you live in a place like Phoenix, Arizona, which is where the video um, was shot, where it gets super hot, right? In the middle of summer, or if you live in a place like Maine, where it gets super cold, um, you can really do some treadmill training with your dogs. It's not hard. Um, crate training, I really, really encourage you all to do crate training. Um, it's gonna be great for in-room. Again, it's gonna be great um, for that pet resume um, and enrichment. So think about activities. You can do some fun puzzle feeders. You can do a smelling garden. Um, it's not always just about physical activity, especially for our dogs. Um, it's about engaging their senses in different ways. Um, and of course, always you have that backup plan whenever you need it. Um, this is a cat room on the bottom. So lots of cat enrichment, get them up at the window. It's like cat TV, um, plenty of storage under the sitting area as well. Um, and the sitting area also 
encourages pet parents to hang out with their pets. So uh, money. Uh, somebody brought up supplies. Uh, if you build it, they will come. So one of the things that I really encourage you to plan for in your physical space is where you're going to store things. Um, this really is a benefit for you. So your human service providers, when you reach out to your pet loving community, um, and to your community at large, folks who haven't maybe donated to you before because they're animal lovers, you're going to tell them about the link uh, and they're going to want to donate to you, whether it be dollars or it be supplies. Um, I really encourage you to think outside the box. Yes, that is a picture of cats and boxes. Um, really think outside the box on this. Work with your collaborative partners on how you can fundraise together. Um, and because pets really can bring a fun element to a hard subject. Um, and so definitely encourage you to think outside the box on this. And there are some grant opportunities, um, which I'm going to show you on the next slide. But I just want, I want to give you this figure um, to show you how much people spend on their pets. In 2020, it was $103.6 billion. So a lot of money. Um, and while you wouldn't be tapping into this money in particular, because this is related to pet products, I think it's a really great representation um, of how much people really love pets. So grant money. Um, we offer up to $60,000 to help you create your pet friendly program. Those are our safe housing grants. Uh, that application is actually always open um, March 1st, June 2nd, and September 1st of each year. You can find it by going to redrover.org slash safe housing. You can also get it uh, you can also go to Rescue Rebuild Renovation Grants, and so they're that nonprofit construction program. You can check out their application there as well. When I'm done talking, I'll make sure to add those links if um, the wonderful domesticshelters.org people don't beat me to it. Uh, and then also think about um, the Paws Act money. Rachel, you're awesome. Thank you so much. Um, the Paws Act money, so uh, OVC money, Emergency and Transitional Pet Shelter and Housing Assistance Grant Program. They have not released the 2022 solicitation yet. Keep an eye out for it. Uh, last year, they gave away, I believe it was five grants at about 500,000 a piece. So it's definitely a lot of money, um, but definitely something to keep, uh, keep an eye out for. And don't forget about your COVID related funding. So uh, we've been hearing from a few domestic violence organizations that have been using some of that um, COVID money to actually pay for like the HEPA filters or some of those pet friendly building materials because they're easier to clean, okay? Um, challenge number six, which is the staff and board buy-in. So um, I really encourage you to review the why on this. Um, so you'll have the slides, uh, have that data. Um, because ultimately, if we're not serving pets, we aren't serving people. Uh, so really that data tells that story, um, that really in order to bring in those folks, in order to get them into services, in order to build that trust, we really need to serve um, their pets. And if you have staff that are worried about it, I totally get it. They're overworked. Um, you know, they have a lot on their plates already. Involve them in that planning. Um, give them space for that no. Give them space for those challenges, kind of like what I did with you all, to give me all your barriers, give me all your challenges, and then work together to get to yes. Um, you know, you have amazing ability to problem solve. You do it all the time. And so just give your staff that opportunity um, to be a part of that process and buy into it. And again, there are benefits to this. Um, you know, there, there's many different ways to have your program um, operate. You know, sometimes we tell um, non-pet owning families, you can't interact with the pets. Uh, some programs, some organizations do that. And the non-pet parents absolutely love it. They enjoy having the pets around. The staff enjoy having the pets around. Uh, and it really makes, uh, their words, it makes the shelter feel like home. And so a real benefit there. Uh, and it, again, it's an opportunity to show compassion and empathy and build trust. Uh, and it's a way to open up dialogue. So I've heard from countless number of folks where survivors didn't want to talk about the abuse they were experiencing, um, but they could talk about it through their pet. Um, 
what happens when human services organizations don't serve people and pets? You know, we're missing that valuable tool. Uh, we're making, um, we're, we're putting our staff in a position to have to say no, we're not trauma informed or survivor centric. Um, survivors delay or they don't leave. Uh, the pets are used as a tool to force return uh, and the abuse potentially continues, right? But what happens when we do serve people and pets? We really help facilitate that healing. We increase staff morale. We build trust, empathy, and compassion. We're giving kids that new story. Um, we're trauma-informed and we are survivor-centric. Uh, we gain those fundraising opportunities and we raise awareness and build support. Domestic violence is a hard subject to talk about. And so for some, talking about pets and their experience within this context is, is a great way, kind of a soft way uh, to introduce that topic of domestic violence. But ultimately it takes a community, right? Um, I mentioned it earlier, uh, we don't want you all to go it alone. You don't have to be the expert in everything. You're the human services experts. Reach out uh, to those folks across the aisle um, to get that support. We talked about it a little bit. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm gonna kind of um, breeze through this pretty quickly because we do talk a lot about it um, in the Don't Forget the Pets program. And I'll even stay on a little bit longer um, for folks to talk about it. Um, but get those animal services folks, get those social workers, um, get those veterinarians, get others in your community involved in this conversation um, in, in your collaborative partnerships. Um, one of our uh, really great executive directors at the Domestic Violence Intervention Program uh, I asked her, what words of wisdom would you share with others? And she said, I don't know if I have words of wisdom other than collaboration is really the key. You would be surprised who your allies might be. And so I really just encourage you to have that conversation um, with everybody, you know, and, and I mentioned animal services, I mentioned veterinarians, but ultimately think about all of these different sectors, all of these different entities, all these folks who are interacting with people and pets um, and get them involved in this conversation have that light bulb moment. Um, you know, there are a lot of folks who don't um, know about the link between human and animal violence. I had my light bulb moment when I came to Red Rover. Um, and so I just really encourage you to have this conversation um, with anybody and everybody. The people heal the pets and pets heal the people. It is worth any extra work on the end of the shelter. There are ways that you can make it not be a whole lot of extra work and that's what we're here to help you with um, but just know in the end it's really going to help you um, if you need more support you know i mentioned the don't forget the pets um, project um, we have free training workshops the next one is coming up on april 26th i believe um, we have a discussion forum we have a coaching program where we can help you a little more one-on-one -on -one. we give you those detailed construction plans and follow-up support definitely check it out don't forget the pets.org i believe i saw the link um, in the chat and before you go and we still have a couple minutes and we have Q&A. So um, I would love to know um, what's something that you are taking away from today. Um, so please go back to that menti.com and let me know um, at least one thing that you are taking away from today. Thank you, Rachel, for putting that um, in the chat again. Yes, we got inspiration, that's awesome. I'm very glad about that. Hope, I love that. Super awesome. Um, honestly, uh, I we talk about this so that um, the workshop itself is about six and a half hours. I don't want to, I don't want to worry anybody. Um, it is six and a half hours with a, a lunch break. Um, we could we we talk about this a lot, and so this is really just a small snippet. Um, I really do encourage you to join us for the workshop. They're virtual, but we also um, love to do these in person. We would actually prefer to do them in person. Um, so if you are, uh, if you think your local community would like to have us come and do an in-person workshop, we would love to do that. You will have my um, email address. So definitely reach out. Um, Ashley and the domestic shelters.org team will also have that information. Um, so we'll definitely get you all the information. I'm going to, the menti.com will obviously stay up for a little bit longer. Thank you um, for sharing that with me. Um, I'm glad to, to see what you all are taking from it. Um, you should see the screen uh, with my contact information and, and my cute pup, um, affectionately referred to as the jerk dog. 
who is no longer with us. She was a jerk till the end though. So Whew, Ashley has a lot of info. Yes. What you got? <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much, Katie. And just so everyone is aware, Katie has agreed to stay on just a little bit past the time. So we're going to dive into Q&A, but if you have to, t- to jump off here in the next five minutes at the, at the official end or the, the, the original end time, um, please do that. This is all being recorded. You'll get a recording so you can hop back and, and uh, get any information that you missed. Um, and so I'll just, I'll give my quick reminder for anyone that's a call in listener to send us an email at info at domestic shelters.org. But yeah, let's dive into some questions, really great information. Um, so glad that you followed up with the end with the whole, the idea of, of getting involved into the, the don't forget the pets training. I, that's actually how I met Katie. They did one in Phoenix, Arizona, where I am located. And I learned so much about, uh, this whole, you know, the, how to start a pet shelter, the barriers, all of those things. So highly encourage everyone to do that because, uh, you know, if you're planning on doing this, there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. You know, you guys have been doing this for a while. So, you know, you've, you've seen it all at this point. Uh, great. So let's, let's start off with some questions. Um, so how do you start the conversation with potential partners in your com- community, um, for kind of your backup plan? So, um, you know, the, the foster care, the, um, you know, boarding things of that nature. Oh yeah. That's, that's such a great question. Um, you know, uh, I will preface it by saying, um, animal shelters, animal welfare organizations in general, um, it's really an interesting time for them. So COVID, um, and I know Tia would agree with this because she comes from from that side of things. Um, You know, pre-COVID, animal shelters were a little leery of kind of jumping in and doing this kind of work. They were definitely a little worried about it. Um, But because of COVID, they realized that they needed to reach out into the community a bit more, and they realized that they needed to do um, different work in order to keep people and pets together. So in general, they're they're focusing more on keeping pets together versus, hey, we're bringing animals in to adopt them back out. Um, And so I will say it's a really great time to start having these conversations. I really just encourage you to pick up the phone or send an email and and start talking to them. One thing that I do tell organizations, uh, animal organizations, a lot is, you know, they're worried about safety. They're worried about safety of their staff, safety of, you know, their fosters. Um, If they aren't asking about domestic violence or homelessness when somebody comes in to relinquish a pet, I guarantee if I were a betting person, I would bet money on this. They have the pets of domestic violence survivors on their adoption floors. So they're already opening themselves up um, to that danger that they're worried about. And so I really just encourage you to have that conversation. If you run into trouble, um, you know, reach out to me. Uh, It's, you know, a conversation we can have. We're really used to having that conversation with folks. We can connect them to other animal um, shelter, animal welfare folks um, who, who can talk them through it. Yeah, that's great. Really great information. Thank you. Um, another question that came in, um, what do, what should people do if a resident is being neglectful? Obviously they brought their pet, they, they care about them, but they're going through so much. There's going to be that situation where they bring the pet and they're not able to care for them. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, what I would encourage you to do um, is think about how would you handle that situation if they were being neglectful to their kids. And so most likely you would um, try and talk to them. You would try and support them through it. Right. Um, And before you get to the point of where you're like, we're taking the pet away from you, maybe utilize your backup plan. And so maybe we need to get the pet into a foster situation for a little bit while the survivor can kind of focus on them, get ready and able to be able to take that pet back in. Um, you, of course, always have that, that kind of option to um, work with your animal welfare partner to get that pet rehomed. But I really just encourage you to use your skills and strategies to help support the survivor, get ready to care for that pet before you get to that point where you take that pet away. Um, I hope that helps. And that's definitely something um, I'd be happy to talk through more with folks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, what suggestions do you have on how to work with a client um, who must flee due to imminent danger and does not have vet records available? You know, all the, the checklist that I'm assuming yeah. you help people put together of what they need, but it's, you know, it's like, a, it's a now situation. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that's often the case. So um, when you create your pet housing program, one of the first things that you need to do is really set up that relationship with a veterinary partner because you want to get that pet um, in to see that vet or have that vet come to you and see you. Do that initial vet exam. Um, one, for the safety and health of the pet to make sure that they're fit and, and healthy. Get some of those basic medications like flea, tick, um, but also begin um, creating that paper trail um, of that pet in the survivor's name. So part of the abuse might mean that the abuser didn't allow the, uh, the pet to be in the survivor's name. So that paperwork to be in the survivor's name. Um, and so you definitely want to start creating that paper trail for that pet with the survivor. I also encourage you to talk to your local animal control, whoever your local law enforcement is ahead of time and talk to them about some strategies um, and how you should, you should work that out so you can be uh, best prepared for it for when it happens. Cause it, it is going to happen. Yeah. It sounds like, I mean, you're kind of reiterating the point that you're saying you don't have to do this alone. You really, you really need those collaborations and those partners to, to get things to happen. Yeah. I do see we're at the, uh, the end or we're all in different time zones here. It's 11 AM where I am. <laughs> um, it's, so we're at the end of the, the official time, but we're going to keep going uh, for 15 minutes. If, if we, the questions keep coming in. Um, so understand if people have to hop off, like I said, we're, we are recording this. So uh, we'll dive in with the next question. Um, what, Let's see. Oh, so I, I, yeah, this one is a, a great one. Um, what about Canada? We have some people on, on the call today in Canada. Are there any uh, resources there? Obviously, you're able to guide them and help them with answer questions, but as far as like funding opportunities and grants. Yeah, Canada is really a uh, really interesting question. Um, so I believe PetSmart Charities has left uh, the, the funding space. Um, so if you're in Canada, um, reach out to me um, and and I'll see if I can dig up some other resources for you. You might also want to reach out to um, an organization called Humane Canada. So they're actually doing some work similar to the Don't Forget the Pets project and just being able to, to walk folks through that process of creating a program. Absolutely anything that we say is going to translate um, into, you know, what you could do in Canada. Um, but, you know, if you want a more local resource, uh, and a resource that might have more knowledge of some funding opportunities up there in Canada, I definitely encourage you to uh, reach out to Humane Canada and I can help make that introduction for you um, if needed as well. So just uh, shoot me an email. Fantastic. Um, let's see, one, uh, one barrier concern that we have is that people leaving their pets and not returning for them. Uh, do you have any advice on how to handle that? Yeah. Um, and uh, to continue on, if, if someone brings a pet with them, um, should they be required to take their pet with them uh, when they leave? If not, yeah. you know, so how do you, how do you handle that situation? Yeah. Yeah. So um, abandoned pets is a, is a concern that we hear a lot about. Um, I will tell you uh, it doesn't happen very often. It is pretty rare that somebody just ups and leave um, uh, up and leaves their pet. Uh, most of the time, um, it's it's a decision that they come to um, for a variety of reasons. And so I encourage a little bit of a language shift on this. So instead of saying abandon, rehome, because honestly, that's that's most of the time what is happening. Um, so what we really encourage you to do uh, is, again, work with those animal welfare partners for when that situation comes up. Um, you know, if they're very rare chance uh, that they do just end up leaving and not returning for their pet, you will get that pet to your animal rescue partner. And ideally what they're gonna do is use their networks to move that pet out of um, the, the geographical area. Abusers are really savvy. Um, and so we do wanna try, we don't want that pet to necessarily be on the adoption floor there locally. Um, and again, I'll just reiterate, most of the time it's a decision. And so I would just encourage you uh, to support that survivor and work through that together with them um, to, to make that decision, because sometimes they are going to make that decision that they just can't care for the pet. I guarantee it's, it's a super hard decision when they when they get to it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing I will note, someone put in the chat, I don't know, I imagine it was related to the, the Canadian resources question, but they said uh, pet safe. Yeah. I don't know if, okay, you're familiar with that organization. They said that's a good one. Yeah. Okay. And the FAM network actually as well. Um, so definitely check out the FAM network. Uh, their foster network um, in Toronto, I believe, um, or Ottawa. 
Um, and so they would have some really great resources. They would also, they're, they're always looking to support organizations up there who want to become pet friendly. So definitely reach out to them. I can also make that connection to Dana um, if, if folks would like. So Awesome. Well, thank you to LT in our chat for, for uh, bringing those resources to the Oh, there you go, LT. Look at yeah. you. Thank you. <laughs> um, next question. Let's see. So do you know any studies that have been done on the way trauma impacts uh, pets behavior long term? Um, so really looking at the, the impact on pets. Yeah, um, you know, definitely that uh, the, the trauma piece is definitely um, Bryn's side of things. And don't forget the pet. She uh, she's a science kid. And so she really gets into that. Um, we do have a couple of resources on um most of the research has been done on canines, dogs. So like canine PTSD, um, there is some research. Um, I can definitely point you towards it. Um, and if you also, if you go and check the website, the don't forget the pets website, I do believe we have it listed on there as well. Um, so we can take the next question, Ashley, and I will look for that resource and I'll drop it in. Um, but there should be some, some places where you can find some of that um, information. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, the next question has been asked multiple times and how do you handle, um, how should the pets be handled when the owner is off site? Cause you know, people have to go to work. They have, they have things they have to do outside of the shelter. They do. Yeah. So, um, you know, depending on which pet plan you're going to utilize, um, that's where some of that crate training can come in really handy. If you're going to be doing it in individual living units, um, that's, uh, definitely a great thing for you to utilize there. You know, if you do some of those things, like make your individual living units, um, pet friendly with the flooring and, you know, all that kind of stuff. If you, um, if you give lots of great enrichment opportunities, you kind of get pets into a routine. That's really going to help a lot of that. We also see a lot of organizations utilize like day kennels. So even if they have pets in individual living units, they may have like a separate outdoor um, day kennel that has, you know, um, depending on like climate and all that, it'll have a safe place to keep dogs cool or warm with like a doggy potty area. Um, so some really easy strategies there um, as well. So yeah, definitely utilize a day kennel or some crate training. Yeah, very good. See. So we'd love to work to enclose our current outdoor kennels and add space for cats. Uh, would expanding on what we already have qualify for a Red Rover grant? Yes. Yes. No? <laughs> uh, I will say um, you are absolutely um, more than welcome to apply. Uh, my hesitation is only because our focus right now is to help ensure that 25% of domestic violence shelters in the U.S. become pet friendly. So that's to say priority is for new um, pet friendly on-site programs, but absolutely anybody is welcome to apply if we're talking about like expanding capacity. Um, you can definitely check out the website for more information on that. The um, application itself is really simple. Um, and so, you know, if you go to apply and maybe you don't get the funding, um, you won't have wasted six months of your time putting together, you know, multiple budgets and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but you certainly are welcome to apply. And we can talk about that more as well, if you'd like. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, have you, oh, have you done any um, DV and pets trainings for veterinarians, um, hoping to deliver training to providers in our community and wondered if there's any good resources for that? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, veterinarians are such an important part of this piece. Um, so we are actively, uh, and that's part of why Tia has joined us um, on the Red Rover team. Um, we are actively working to engage the veterinary community. So at Tellum, at Tellum Ross University School of Medicine Foundation, I totally did not say any of that right. And I'm very sorry. Um, they are supporting us right now in this effort. And so we are actively engaging their alumni. We're creating a 90 minute pilot workshop specifically for veterinarians, but more importantly, veterinarians are more than welcome to uh, attend our virtual workshops. We do talk about their role in this um, and 
Every time we had to have a in-person workshop, we um, absolutely reach out to them to try and engage them in this conversation as well. Um, and we do have a specific web page on Don't Forget the Pets that is designed for them. Um, and I will pop that into the um, chat as well. Awesome, yeah, really important. Um, let's see, do you feel, so we talk, you talk about like the, the pet program, which, which route you're going to go on site, off site, all those different things. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel that housing the pet with a resident should be the first choice uh, or would you encourage them to seek pet fostering from a family member first? So um, I, I would always encourage pets to be with their pet parents as much as they can. Um, I know that if I had to be separated from my pet, that would be extremely difficult for me um, working through trauma, right? Um, so that is definitely first choice for me. However, there are certainly some, some situations that we've heard where survivors um, didn't get out of bed for 48 hours. Um, you know, 36 hours, however long it was. And for them, what was more um, helpful was to have that pet into a foster, um, in, with a foster family. And so I think kind of, you know, one of our overarching mantras to all of this uh, is that you need to have different levels, different, different tiers of help, um, you know, because there really are going to be different situations. There's not a one size fits all. And so, you know, I definitely would encourage the pet be with a pet parent, but have that backup plan for when that's just not the best um, situation for that. And that really means that we're being survivor centric, right? And really understanding that survivors um, have really different experiences. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so uh, in your experience, uh, where do you store pet records? Uh, are they connected to client files? Um, uh, let's see. We don't know. You know. Do they need to be scanned to client files? So obviously there's going to be differences in every single program, but yeah. anything you can kind of uh, talk about when you're storing pet records? Yeah, that's that's a really interesting question, actually. Um, and I would say that each organization does it really differently. Um, I might have to do some digging on that to get a more specific answer. I think, um, my initial answer would be that most of the time those pet, um, that pet information is staying with that, that survivor information. Um, you know, and I, I think it kind of relates to that next question that just came into the chat, Ashley, <laughs> would, would we need to do a pet intake? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, pet intake is actually a really important piece of this. And so this pet intake information would go with the family information. Mm -hmm. When you do a pet intake, um, it, it's a lot like a, uh, the, the human intake, right? So, you know, basic demographic information, what kind of animal is this? What's the animal's name? What breed? Um, I, if you want to ask like color markings, that's cool too. Um, what I would encourage you to really uh, pay attention to on this intake and, and to get information on are a couple of things like, has the pet ever bitten anyone? But don't ask that question if you don't ask the follow-up question, is, which is, if yes, what were the circumstances? Because um, you really want to know, are there some things that you can avoid or how can you um, set this pet up for success um, on site? My cat is about to join us. So I'm very, sorry about that. <laughs> no, I, I encourage it. Um, so you definitely want to ask, you know, has the pet bitten anyone? What were those circumstances? But then you also want to ask some questions like, um, where did the pet spend most of its day? Uh, was it inside, outside, in a crate, in a kennel? Um, where did the pet sleep at night? Was it on your bed? Was it on their own bed? Was it in a crate? Um, these are basically uh, just trying to understand how the pet lived their life before they came into shelter. Now, you won't be able to replicate everything, but the more that you can help keep that pet stay in routine, the easier transition it's going to be for that pet, the less barking, the less opportunity for, um, you know, PTSD and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yes, please definitely do an intake. I think Tia dropped in um, document library. We've got a couple of intake forms there and, and we can talk through it more in, in a webinar. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, let me just look at these questions, see if there's anything yeah. that just could be handled in, in 30 seconds or less. <laughs> yeah. um, Okay, that's a little... 
For those of you concerned yeah. about allergies, I will be washing my hands immediately after we were done. <laughs> well, good. Well, let's go ahead and let's wrap up. Any, any final words or nuggets of information you want to share uh, before we send everyone off uh, on their way? I, I would just say thank you to, to all the folks on here. Um, you do incredible, amazing. You do the hard work every day. Um, we're here to support you um, and in this process. And, and Ashley and Hannah and Rachel, just thank you again for, for having us on and, and all that you do to support um, our work. We really enjoy our partnership with you all. Yeah, us as well. Well, thank you so much. Always, always a pleasure to get to spend time with you. And thank you to everyone who tuned in today. Uh, just a reminder, this has been recorded. So we'll send out the, the edited version of, of this webinar along with a certificate of attendance and resources uh, within a week of, of this webinar. So if you're on, a, on the phone right now about to hang up, make sure you send us an email because we don't have your email address uh, unless you're uh, send that to us and we'll add you on the list. But with that, we'll go ahead and conclude today's presentation. Thank you everyone. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.